Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for August 2nd. August. The summer is almost over. 2013. Uh, so this week, we are going to be talking about uh, images of asteroid DZ-15, uh, how Comet Ison might or might not fizzle, uh, the minimum solar maximum, uh, the polarization of the, uh, of the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, the more information on the spacesuit leak that happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Japanese launch that's going to be happening tomorrow, and uh, a new supernova in M74. So joining me this week, a few familiar faces, so I'll get to those first. We've got Sandy Springman down at the Arecibo Observatory. Sandy. Hi. Uh, we've got uh, David Dickinson. Tr hey. Trusty, go. dependable David Dickinson. Uh, in Florida, aka Astro Guys. And we've got from a long hiatus traveling who knows where she's been. I don't know Nicole either. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Nicole Gallucci. But now you're back I've home. I've been everywhere. I'm man. Home. I've been everywhere. Yes. That. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've got a fresh recruit this week. We've got Brian Koberlein, who has been doing a fantastic job of reporting all kinds of cool space stuff on, uh, on Google. Uh, Brian, can you give people a bit of a background on who you are and what you do and what you know? Uh, I'm an astrophysicist. I'm a physics professor at Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. Um, I just finished a book on computational astrophysics, and Ooh. I've been writing on Google Plus every day for six months now. <laughs> yeah, seriously, if you haven't already, go and circle Brian on Google Plus. He has been using it as his blogging platform and just writing these terrific explainers on 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 space and astronomy, some very accessible stuff, some that's quite technical but but really interesting. I've been a huge fan of this and that after Brian had been doing this, I was like, Brian, you gotta join us. So uh, and and then also Brian, I think uh, before we kind of get into the show, I wanted to give you a chance to promote something that you're working on, which I'm I'm I think is just fantastic. You're you're doing a Kickstarter for a television show. Right. Right. Well we're we're doing a Kickstarter for a series of web videos first. And then we want to expand those into a TV show. It's called Prove Your World, and it's aimed at 8 to 13-year-olds. And its main purpose is to teach scientific understanding and what you might call habits of mind for that age group, how to approach scientific problems. And one of the things we're excited about it is it's based on real questions from kids, and it uses inquiry learning. It's not just, here's a cool fact, here's a cool fact. It actually looks at the process of scientific learning, and it has puppets. <laughs> yeah, and so I think, I guess, do a search for Prove Your World Kickstarter. You've got 15 days left, I think, on the Kickstarter now, so right. everyone should check that out and kick in a couple of bucks and help you guys be able to make the make that that pilot and that first run of series. And you're not asking for a lot, and I I think that'll be that'll be great. I think it's a it's a great niche to teach the kids. So so that's fantastic. Uh, wait a second. What? Alan Boyle <laughs> has joined us at the last minute. Can, can all you, all can hope you was me? lost. No, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, you can hear me? Beetle. We can hear you. Yeah. Oh, wow. It says I have audio problems. I, I'm, I've got all sorts of issues, but uh, that's just me. You know, Just uh, go, go ahead with uh, what you got. I'll, I'll get set up here. Glad to be with you after uh, a little bit of travail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, so that means that I get to add one topic to the uh, to the Excellent. list of stories we're going to be talking about today, right? What what topic would that be? I I hear you visited a secret facility in the Seattle area. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> do you want to talk about that now? Uh, my my. I, yeah, I totally trip want to, to talk Blue about Origin. I, I totally want to talk about that right now. Oh, I, I want to push everything <laughs> one down the list. And uh, and get to and hear this. So, if people don't know, Alan Boyle had exclusive access to the Blue Origin facility. This is the rocket launch company being created by Jeff Bezos from from Amazon fame. Uh, what happened? Well, uh, I think the only reason why I got to go down there is because I live in the area, and uh, Blue Origin wanted to I get... I live in the area? <laughs> well, you, you can't come down when they call up in the morning and, and say, hey, can you come over to Kent and, and uh, talk with, uh, with uh, Rob Meyerson. But uh, anyway, Blue Origin was actually... Uh, they built this facility, oh, seven years ago, uh, but uh, they really haven't had any journalists in. 
it's just the sort of thing where they work very quietly. Some might call it hush-hush or secretive. Uh, they, they just don't want to talk about stuff until they have stuff to talk about. And, and so um, they want to talk about uh, an issue having to do with uh, Kennedy Space Center's launch pad 39A, one of the launch pads that the shuttle used and is now considered surplus. Uh, NASA wants to turn that over to a commercial facility and uh, SpaceX has applied to, to get that pad. Uh, SpaceX was founded by billionaire Elon Musk and now uh, Blue Origin, which was founded by Amazon billionaire uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, also would like to have uh, control of that launch pad and uh, so they wanted to get the word out about that and I think they they figured uh, if we're gonna talk with this guy who's in the neighborhood sure why don't we bring him down and and see if he <laughs> gets into any trouble so I had to be on my best behavior but they did uh, sign me in at uh, Blue Origin headquarters they said I'm the first journalist to, to oh, actually be in there and um, it's a really nice place. I got to tell you that uh, that uh, they have a, like a two-story high rocket sculpture with a fireplace in the lobby. They've got a ten-foot wide uh, globe that is kind of one of the part of the decor for the lobby. Uh, they have models of the Starship Enterprise from. Uh, from the Star Trek movies uh, in the lobby. Another place they've got uh, Discovery One from 2001 hanging from the ceiling. Uh, they've got uh, a little um, model from Silent Running of these uh, geodomes uh, along a hallway, and uh, it, it's a nice place. Uh, and so, so this fancy description of the decor is you setting us up for the fact that you can't talk about anything else, right? No, no, I, uh, <laughs> I, I can, you know, I, I didn't see very much. They kind of uh, took me in. It's not as if they took me to their big production facility where they actually build the rockets, although you could see that. They have a test range uh, in Kent as well, uh, just a, a little test stand, and, and you can see that from the street. So th there are lots of stuff. There's lots of stuff you can see from from outside the building, and and I've seen that before. But I, I've not been let into the inner sanctum before, and so that was something new. So what is the plan? I mean, what is Bezos's plan with this company? Because we've seen so much about SpaceX, and they've been moving in leaps and bounds. Yeah. And it feels like Blue Origin has been, as you say, sort of toiling away in right. quiet mystery for almost a decade now. It's What's it's funny. Happen? Yeah, it's funny how uh, people used to think of SpaceX as the uh, upstart, uh, kind of the the scrappy underdog. But now SpaceX looks like uh, it's really in a great position to to make itself one of the one of the top uh, companies in uh, in spaceflight, in as far as uh, getting stuff to the International Space Station and eventually sending astronauts, and so. Uh, you have uh, companies like uh, Blue Origin, which have been working in the background. Uh, they actually did some pretty ambitious tests. Unfortunately, one of their tests went awry when they had a, a test production a, a propulsion vehicle uh, go supersonic, but then yeah, it had some that. flight instability, yeah. and uh, they had to get it crashed. So that, that was definitely a setback. But it's also uh, a challenge. SpaceX also poses a challenge to the established players such as United Launch Alliance. And so you have this interesting, strange bed bedfellow situation where United Launch Alliance and Blue Origin are teaming up uh, for a multi-user launch facility that they want to uh, turn Launchpad 39A into. And SpaceX uh, wants to use this for a lot of its uh, a lot of its commercial launches, also the launches to the space station, uh, as a dedicated facility just for SpaceX. And so that's the issue. Uh, actually, in the last few days, NASA has been kind of signaling that they would probably turn 39A over to SpaceX and that 39B, the other uh, shuttle launch pad, would become a multi-user facility. 39B would also be used for tests of the space launch system, this big heavy lift rocket that, that NASA is developing. So it's a very interesting clash of the billionaires. Uh, right now it looks as if Elon <laughs> Musk and, and SpaceX are 
in the lead, but but uh, Blue Origin wants to make it make its presence felt, and and they have big plans to start sending stuff into orbit in 2018. In the meantime, they would operate the launch pad as a facility for their orbital tests, and also allow other people like United Launch Alliance and maybe some other launch providers to to use that pad as well. Uh, but I have a feeling that NASA is going to announce a decision on this pretty quickly because. They want to turn over this pad by October 1st. So, I mean, you really get the feeling with all the conversations that you've seen and in the interviews. I don't know. Have you had a chance to interview Elon Musk? He is he is a true believer. He's one of us. He is absolutely dedicated to putting humans in space and keeping them there and maybe letting them go to Mars. Yeah. You get that same feeling, like in the DNA of Blue Origin, that, that Bezos really wants this or is it see is another money making opportunity? I do, but I also get a very strong feeling that Jeff Bezos has to be careful about this because he is, you know, he runs a publicly traded company. I, I think that's why you see so much restraint is that uh, Jeff wants to make sure that this does not interfere with uh, how Amazon.com goes about its business. And so he, he that's why he's keeping a bit lower profile. And he does have a fortune that is uh, about eight to ten times as rich as uh, Elon Musk's, so he doesn't ha have to worry about fundraising or getting contracts. Uh, I, I really haven't talked with Jeff Bezos about this, but I have talked with Rob Meyerson, who is the president of Blue Origin, and he says that Jeff is willing to keep at this for 10, 20, 30 years, uh, that he does believe in this and that his, his uh, goal of making access to space cheaper and more reliable it has not he's he hasn't wavered from that goal uh, for a, for a decade and he expect, expects it to continue wow. it's interesting yeah. yeah no that's that's fantastic I think that they, they need to hurry up I'm getting old so <laughs> my, <laughs> right. my jetpack's not here yet so. <laughs> Uh, okay, great. Well, I, I'm again. I am super jealous. And uh, well, next time I, they I, I put together I'm the list, that, yeah, I, I'm hoping that they'll they'll be able to invite some more people. And I think that uh, you do see a change that as they get more toward uh, operations that they want to tell people about. That's when they're going to start opening the doors a little more freely. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. So so now now this is great now. If anyone knows, uh, Universe Today, we wrote an article. David, you wrote an article on, I guess, about a week ago about uh, asteroid DZ-15, about yeah, and requested uh, a little telescope time on Arecibo. Nancy, Nancy <laughs> threw it my way, and I had kind of heard about it, but it hadn't really grabbed my interest. It was uh, 2003 uh, DZ-15 passed, be, I believe it was nine lunar distances from the Earth. It so was it really close. It was like 20 yeah. seconds round trip at its closest. Yeah, so like usually, usually my rule of, of uh, interesting for backyard astronomy is either closer than the moon or brighter than 10th magnitude. So it didn't quite, I think it reached about 14th magnitude that's closest, so I didn't try to go after it telescopically. But we did write an article because uh, I think it, it was iTelescope or somebody was running it live. They were going to do a broadcast for it. So we began talking about, and usually in my course of writing up the article, I wondered if anybody at Goldstone or anybody was going to actually ping this asteroid. So I got to talking to Sandy down at Arecibo about prospects of whether you guys were going to go after it or not. And so I went on Horizons, but misread one of the columns and said, oh, it's a little too far away. And then we looked at it again and we realized actually we could do it. And so we were real wondering why this object wasn't on the usual Arecibo list. Because if something's coming this close, it was about 20 seconds away for a while. Usually we can nab it. And it turns out that when it was first observed in 2003, they didn't have a very good orbit for it. So it was lost ah, okay. for a number of years. And around July 20th, a lot of uh, uh, amateurs started looking at it and they sent in some some measurements to the Minor Planet Center and that improved the orbit enough that we could actually look at it. So thank you amateurs with your big telescopes yeah, and thank yeah, you, yeah. or relatively big yeah. telescopes, thank you amateurs in general. <laughs> Anyone who looks at near-Earth yeah. asteroids, we like you a lot. Four, so, 14th, uh, magnitude. We, 14th magnitude is, is reasonable for a large scope under dark skies to go after. Yeah. I mean, so. we, we did things like that in undergrad, and we had a 24-inch telescope, yeah. but we had a 24-inch telescope. Most folks don't have those. Yeah. So we had a four-day weekend last weekend, and we the boss was heading out of town, and we were heading out of town. He said, eh, when you get back in on Monday, write an urgent proposal. So we wrote an urgent proposal on Monday. It was accepted on Tuesday, and um, la yesterday afternoon, 
Can I screen share? I want to screen share. Yesterday afternoon, we got some lovely little images of 2003 DZ15, the first object requested over Twitter at Arecibo <laughs> Observatory. <laughs> That's so. so well, I didn't realize we made history. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this was the first Twitter-induced urgent proposal. So it looks like an asteroid. Twitter target um, of opportunity. Oh my gosh. Oh. I, wish, I wish this had all happened before I wrote the Sky and Telescope article. I could have dropped that whole story in there about oh, yeah. well, I Twitter's mean, this being way. used to alert astronomers for things. So yeah, there you go. There's um, our happy little asteroid. It looks like a smudge. It's you know, it's really small. So while we can get seven and a half meter resolution, um, it's still what a hundred meters across, two hundred meters across. It's not terribly think, large. Yeah, it was about 150. I think it was about the size of the Tunguska impactor, right in that range. Oh, interesting. Can you, yeah. can you zoom yeah. in? Is it actually resolved here, or is there um, is that like I mean, noise? You, How much of that is? Um, so the white object, the white, the the white is uh, reflection. So this isn't actually an image. This is a delay Doppler map. Mm -hmm. So the vertical axis that is um, distance away. So the transmitter, think of the transmitter being down here. The first. Uh, um, first echo bounces off the front of the asteroid, the second echo bounces off a little further back. Then the uh, x-axis, that's mm -hmm. uh, Doppler. So that's frequency. how okay. fast this thing is rotating. So this is a little bit of a frequency spread. So this is, okay. it's not very big, so it might be rotating slow, it might be rotating fast, but it's just kind of tiny, so it's not going to look great. But you so can reprocess it and make yeah. it look a little wider. But yeah, so you know, it looks like out, an it's not an actual Im it's not an actual image, right? This is data that's being interpreted in a different yes, way. This, it's the frequency yeah. versus the delay. Yeah. yeah, it's the frequency. It's it's how far away it is, and then how fast it's rotating. So yeah, I mean, and it's cool. not probably not a binary. I don't think it's it's doesn't have a moon or anything. But you don't really see small um, asteroids that have moons or are contact or are are equal size binaries. That doesn't seem to be a case. There's a cutoff. I don't know, around 300 meters. So. I looked a little bit ahead in the projections, and this was the closest pass for this century for that asteroid, too. Yay! And there's we got it. In, I mean, we would have loved... There's one in 2056, I think, that's nearly as close. So if we're still doing Google Hangouts, we can talk about it again in 2056. <laughs> right. Be implanted in your skull. Uh, yeah. Doesn't that feel... This feels like a bit like a movie, like we're in Battleship or something, and you're presenting <laughs> this. I'm seeing this strange object at the very limits of uh Can you zoom in my, one more time? Can, Give me, oh, you, you want to see it and, again? And no, yeah. no, no. Oh, you want no, to yeah, see it? No, yeah, zoom in one more time. I'm going to take a screenshot and post it in the... Do you want no! to enhance and magnify? Can you enhance no! and magnify? Yeah. No. <laughs> do, I, do I see some kind of laser system on pew, the edge of that? Pew, pew. It's a It's a planet killer. No. Yes, nerds. DS9 is the name of the program she's using to oh, display yes. the image, and it is named after the Star Trek series. So the previous version was called TNG. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because they're dorks at Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory yep. who make the software. We love yep. them to death. We love everyone at SAO who makes excellent software and excellent products to help us keep doing astronomy. So, thank you. Yeah, it's an asteroid. Yay, this is what we do. It's great here. I like zapping rocks. It's lots of fun. Uh, speaking of, of rocks that need to be zapped, uh, Comet Ison... <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna made, bow out. No. You're gonna bow up. Well, thank you for bringing the images of your of your asteroid. Feel free to bring anytime. more anytime. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Sandy. Um, tell your tell your Congress people that planetary is great and they should keep funding. You know, thing. You know, Arecibo Observatory. Since we don't vote here, we don't have con Congress people. So, yeah. cheers. <laughs> Uh, right, so a uh, comet Ison, which uh, had sort of, I guess we have been, or it has been the comet of the century, the comet of our lifetime, the greatest comet that will ever <laughs> exist and will ever be seen, and or we not. have been, or not, and we have been trying to really manage people's expectations that, well, it might might be great, might not be great, we won't know until it goes beyond behind the sun. Comets but, are fickle. Yeah. Comets yeah. are fickle. The, but the, the this, wackiness has already begun. But this week there's a bit of a controversy, and some Someone had had yeah. posted some research that, in fact, the comet was going to suck. It was, it was an interesting study, actually, what went around Twitter and the internet. It was uh, Monday night. Was a paper that came out. I first saw it on the Double AVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. They tweeted it out, which is a pretty reliable source, so it, it caused me to grab the attention. Uh, it said that Comet Ison was going to fizzle. Is exactly, I believe, is what the words was that it was. Comet Ison will fail. Claiming. 
Now this came out of a researcher at the Department of Physics and Astrophysics Computational Group in, in Colombia, in the country of Colombia, University of Colombia, down in Medellin. So it was kind of an odd source, it wasn't one that usually you see a lot, but it, again, it came through enough channels that it merited my attention. And the first thing when I think well, I'm going to write an article is I look in the back end of Universe Today to see if Jason or Nancy haven't already written three articles about it. And Nancy was already working on an article about it, so I kind of laid off. I tweeted a little bit about what my conjectures were and my whole armchair pundit view of Comet Ison and stuff. But, but it was interesting to note how many, I believe, the Weather Channel ran with it. A bunch of people ran with it and started publishing Ison is a dud articles immediately. Nancy, I think, took about 24 hours to get hers out, and I kind of felt for her because I watched on the back end of WordPress where I could see her revisions going on, and I could see that she was really researching it and interviewing. Uh, she re interviewed, uh, I don't know, the, the, the handle is at Sungrazers on Twitter. Uh, I don't know who's behind the handle, but she uh, interviewed a bunch of people for the post that were experts on it and uh, kind of put a sanity check on the whole post saying that, you know, these researchers don't have access to any other information that the rest of researchers, they don't have any kind of exclusive access to this information. I personally think since the original paper was in Spanish that maybe a few things, I've seen this before on Twitter and on the internet where things get put into Google translators and they come across with a different tone than what they're supposed to when they're, what, what was originally intended. So, uh, but it was an interesting study to see how many, how quickly everybody jumped on the ice and fizzled bandwagon within minutes to hours. That was like all over the internet and all over the message boards too. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, you see this kind of thing quite a bit. But I guess they want to take the what's the British term? They want to take the piss out of it. They want to, yeah. you know, everyone has been so effusive about what this comet could possibly do. And you I think almost just have to drop the word Ison into a room full of journalists and they're just like feeding piranhas right now. <laughs> Chumming the water. Like, yeah. yeah. And so for someone to kind of go against the grain and say, well, no. And and I guess, the, but the point is that they didn't really bring anything new to the table. And so no. they said the same thing. Every that we've all that we've all been saying, which is it might be great and it might suck and we won't know until it goes behind the sun and we're not gonna know until November. So, be patient. Please. I, I, I interviewed John Bortle. Uh, he's uh, been researching comets for quite some time and observing comets for the last few decades, a few months ago. And I kind of fall in the same camp where he was saying, you know, it's not gonna reach tenth magnitude, which is about the range of a backyard telescope to binoculars, probably till late September. So I think we're gonna see a lot of these has ice and fizzled uh, articles coming out over the next few months and we've said over and over again I think perihelion at the end of November is where it's really going to be crucial if it survives perihelion comes back around we're gonna have a bright uh, Christmas comet this year if it goes toward perihelion and breaks apart we're gonna have nothing we're gonna have comet LNN from a few years ago did the same mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to add, um, Sun Grazer is Carl Badham's at the uh, Naval Research Laboratory, and he's one of the organizers of the Comet ISON observing campaign. So they're, they're watching it closely. You know, it might fizzle, it might uh, be a real star, but in any case, it's going to be an interesting uh, focus of scientific observation, and that's what the ISON campaign is all about. And in fact, uh, I think they're in the last hours of a uh, conference that's being live streamed about uh, getting ready for Comet ISON. If you go to isoncampaign.org, I think you'll probably get to the links to the live stream, and, and uh, yeah, they've, been, they've been talking about this for, for the last day or two. Yeah, Ison's on the other side of the sun right now, so we're not getting good looks at it. Right. And I think a lot of sites are kind of jumping the gun on their how to observe Ison posts at the end of August because it's still going to be very faint and hard to find into the morning sky still. I'm probably not going to put together a big blow-by-blow -blow how to observe Ison post till late September or so because then we're, we're going to start. It's going to become. It's going to come in range of amateur telescopes at that point. Do you think you'd write a story saying, okay, nothing to see here, forget it, it's all off? <laughs> I'd hate to. I'd, it would break my heart <laughs> to write something like that. I hope, you would. I hope we, yeah, I, I mean, if it started breaking apart, I think, you know, yeah. there, there will be a point when, when it's, uh, it's going to be beyond, like, reproach. But it's like, I, I haven't had a good visual comment from my backyard since Hale-Bopp, really. 
Uh, I, I missed, uh, what was the one Hakutake? in 2006? No, Hayukutaki I got. There was one in 2006 went to the Southern Hemisphere. Not McHoltz. Who was it, McHoltz? McNaught? Comet McNaught. Yeah, one of the McNaughts. You're right, because he discovered several. There was a bright one, but that wasn't good for North. We haven't had a good Northern Hemisphere comet since Hayukutaki and Hill Bob. I actually was visiting Phil Plate, and he brought out his telescope, and we looked at McNaught together. Yeah, it Southern was, Hemisphere gets all fun. Good times. Good times. <laughs> good times. Where is Phil? I, I still remember Hale Bopp was circumpolar, and you could watch it. I lived in Alaska at the time, but you could go out and watch it all night. It stayed above the horizon, like yeah. continuously. So that was awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, now <laughs> we're gonna give Brian a really simple, very easy to explain uh, story about the polarization of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which we continuously joke in Astronomy Cast with with Pamela, Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host, that you could pretty much find anything you need in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Age of the universe, what's it made of, how big is it, what shape is it? It's all in there. So, Brian, uh, what's the story? Uh, well, this is a series of observations, a paper which was just published from the South Pole Telescope that was looking at polarization of the cosmic background, uh, cosmic microwave background light. And the reason why this is interesting is because m most of the time when we think of the cosmic microwave background, we look at the brightness or the temperature variations and we say, oh, well, that tells us something. Um, but this is actually looking at the orientation of the light. and and the reason it's important is because you get polarization from last scattering. So basically the cosmic microwave background is the light when the when the light of the Big Bang is finally free. When when the atoms have formed and now the universe is transparent, you can finally see through the long distances. Well, just before that happened, you had the kind of last scattering off of the ions. And when, when they scatter off the ions, you can get polarized light. And there's, there's kind of two kinds. There's what's called E-mode and what's called B-mode. And they're named after the, um, the shapes are similar to electric and magnetic fields, which is why they're called E-mode and B-modes. And the original scattering is E-mode. So what happened after that last bit of plasma after the Big Bang was E-mode. And the B-mode comes out in two ways. One is it can happen in gravitational lensing. So when light lenses around a galaxy, uh, it can cause kind of a twist, if you will, to the orientation of the polarization. And so you can get localized B-mode polarization. But, and this is what they saw. So they saw the polarization from the gravitational lensing. Uh, but it's important for two reasons. One is it's a proof of concept, because there's a more interesting B-mode that we're looking for and that would be on a cosmic scale. So you can look at local B-mode polarization, but if you look over the whole cosmic scale, you should see um, a B-mode pattern that comes from the inflationary period. So basically, the, you, know, you have the early universe really tiny, and then it enters the inflationary period, and it goes boom, really fast. Basically, that's like ringing a bell. And so it creates gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves will rotate the polarization to create B-mode polarization. If we can observe that, then we will have evidence that the inflationary period is real. So we don't have to go with, well, it solves the problems. We don't have to do the indirect. We would then have direct evidence of the inflationary period. So what these guys did is they observed local B-mode polarization, which shows that we can find it. So now we'll see if Planck can see it. So they they sort of proved their method on being able to see this polarization, which then, if they can sort of scale this up, they might be able to to really verify whether the inflationary period happened or didn't. Right, right. So this was kind of, we detected it first, so they get first cred. And then there's other teams that are looking for it, but basically, if you, as you do a sky survey of B-mode polarization, then you can map out what the um, inflationary period was. 
because we had I, we had actually talked about this. Uh, Dr. Matthew Francis had talked about this earlier, uh, a couple of months ago, about how there was new evidence that maybe the inflationary theory was not quite as necessary as it had originally been, and there was so so this is good that I guess there's a new test that will maybe bring inflation back or or. If they or don't see it, it or prove it wrong, so if they don't see yeah. it, will they? Will this be proving it wrong? Uh, it'll it'll put a, a big stake in it. It'll put a really? big stake in the part um, because we've shown that we can find bemole polarization. So so if we don't see it, then either the inflationary period didn't happen, or it happened in a way that we don't expect, and so we're not seeing what we think we see. Now the you now for those who don't understand the inflationary period that's there to exp like what is that there to explain what why has that theory been created? Uh, well, it, it it solves a couple of things. One is that if you look around the universe, it's it's very even. You don't get huge clumps over large scales. You see little clumps and stuff, but it's very homogeneous. And given the size of the universe, if there wasn't an inflationary period, there wouldn't have been time for hot spots to even out. There wouldn't have been time for cold spots to warm up and hot spots to cool down. And so the inflationary model posits that all of this kind of renormalization, the, the homogenization of, of the temperatures happened before the inflationary period when the universe was extraordinarily tiny. And then it inflated and it was already uniform. Um, it also explains what's called the flatness problem. Why is the universe Globally, why does it globally appear to be flat? Um, because it, it shouldn't be, if given unless there was some mechanism like inflation that would cause that. Right, and with flat, like if you take two parallel lines, right, you take two laser go, beams, they should keep going. Yeah, together, line, basically, you know, <laughs> forever. Yep. Um, or hit you in the back of the head, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, so, okay, great. So, when do you think this experiment, this sort of when will Planck sort of be able to make this experiment and get us to the bottom of this? Uh, I'm not sure of the exact timeline. Usually they do kind of a two-year survey, so every two years. Um, I'm not sure when they're scheduled to, to come out with the Planck survey. And if they do, as you say, put a stake in inflation, what does that mean for for this mystery? Is it just is it back to square one? The theory guys do a happy dance and we start playing around with ideas. <laughs> Wow. The theory guys can get grant money again. Yeah. Oh, right. So it, because inflation was canon at this point. Yeah. It's well. I mean, it's it's not canon, but it is the strongest candidate for explaining what we see. So it's it's one of those things that happens in astrophysics sometimes where we have a really good idea. It matches what we see, but we have zero evidence for it directly. We can say, oh, it solves this. It solves this. It solves this. It's a great idea. Just don't Where's feed the evidence? don't feed the conspiracy theorists that want to overthrow the Big Bang theory, <laughs> where they say, "Oh, there's right. something well, wrong with that's it." Right. that's going to come up again. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, if we don't find inflation, you can bet that the uh, Big Bang doubters they'll, will start they'll coming jump up with us again. It's a it's yeah. something to say. Oh, steady state must be. We, we have to go back to the the oil era. <laughs> right. Right. Um. Uh. Michael Breslin just said on YouTube that we need to go long today. He's got a three and a half hour car ride and needs material. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. We, I don't think we can go three and a half hours. I, I don't think we're going to last another 15 minutes. Um, okay, well, let's you move on. You can get this in your car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. It's like, maybe it's a Tesla. Uh, okay, so now, Alan, have you been tracking this Japanese launch that's going to be happening tomorrow? You've been... Uh, not closely, but uh, one of the interesting things about the Japanese launch is that there are a number of CubeSats on, on that launch. You know, this this is uh, and so we've written about the CubeSat phenomenon, and uh, I believe that uh, Ardusat, uh, this uh, this Kickstarter type campaign, is going to be one of the CubeSats to be launched uh, once the uh, once the Japanese HTV uh, vehicle gets up to the space station and so I think we're really seeing kind of a commercialization through the back door of, uh, of uh, kind of these uh, nano satellites uh, going up as part of the payload uh, nano racks which is the uh, commercial concern uh, that's headed by Jeffrey Manber of Mir fame uh, is organizing a lot of these CubeSat deployments and, and so we might see kind of a 
under the radar commercialization of space station operations through launches like this. And so that that's kind of my main interest in the HTV launch, but uh, I'd like to point out, too, that the uh, ISS is starting a, a series of North American and European passes where it's going to be visible, so that means anything going to dock with it is going to be visible, too. So if you have a visible ISS pass, you might want to watch for HTV4. I'll be tracking it on Twitter after it launches for visibility, but I have seen the ATV, the European ATV, following uh, the ISS before or after docking. HTV is going to take six days to go toward docking, so it's going to be up there a while. It's interesting to watch as, uh, as it approaches. I've seen Dragon approach the ISS before in the shuttle when it was up, too. It's always kind of neat to watch because you'll see them as two, like a bright star and a faint star passing overhead. So, Very cool. Uh, okay, so then the other thing is this update on the spacesuit leak that happened during the spacewalk, and we, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago, and it was pretty pretty nerve-wracking situation yeah, was, where... It, it, it was interesting to watch as it unfold because I kind of had it going on one monitor uh, when they're usually doing a spacewalk or anything space-related is going on, and I was working, and I kind of started turning attention toward it when uh, when Luca Parmitano, the ESA, the Italian ESA astronaut, started having a leak, uh, reported water in his helmet. And you got to think, too, they were saying the water on this recent report, he actually talked some about it. There was a video on YouTube where he actually discussed a lot of what was going on at the time, and he said the water was up toward... Uh, his ears, and going toward his eyes and nostrils. Now, you're in zero G, too, so it's not necessarily going to pool down to the bottom of your helmet. So that's going to make it even scarier. You're going to get kind of that fishbowl kind of action going on. They got him in. It was an hour and 32 minutes uh, into the spacewalk when they brought him in as soon as he reported the leak. They're not sure right now. They're still investigating. They're saying uh, Cassidy was quoted as saying that it was cooling water that got into the ventilation somehow. I know that Parmitano was saying, Cassidy was the other uh, astronaut that was walking with him, spacewalking. Parmitano was saying that the water, uh, it, it didn't taste like ordinary drinking water you have in the suit that's there available. It had a different kind of funny chemical taste to it uh, initially, so it was actually somehow as coolant water was leaking into the suit, they believe. They're still investigating that. The progress that launched this past weekend was bringing up equipment to repair that spacesuit. I know that, that they practiced on that progress and that docked. That was on a fast track docking, so that only took like a little over five hours on two orbits to get up there. Four hours and something, I believe it was. It was very fast. I watched the docking a few hours after that. But uh, they got a lot of the initial stuff done they needed on that spacewalk. I know a lot of the other stuff they're going to have to do on a later spacewalk. They were prepping a lot, actually, for that progress in the HTV and everything that's going up there. So I don't know when they're going to spacewalk again, but probably not until this investigation gets done. Yeah, I don't think that there are any U.S. spacewalks uh, ske scheduled anytime soon. I think at the time that Parmitano had this problem come up, they, they talked about how there are Russian spacewalks that are coming up, but, uh, but the U.S. spacewalks, they can put that on hold for a while. It's ironic. There's been a lot of sci-fi disaster spacewalks that are, I know, with gravity coming out. Everybody's seen the trailer for that. Uh, Europa Report, I just saw that last night, uh, awesome movie. I, I broke down and rented it on Amazon, so that had a spacewalk gone bad in it as well. Pretty pretty accurate movie, I was impressed. Yeah, I liked it too, we could talk about that. Uh, just uh, <laughs> Yeah, let's, 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 uh -huh. let's definitely, yeah, I, I did, hadn't put this on the list, but in fact I have, have been wanting to see this. Uh, I'm not sure where I can see it in Canada though, so... It's on, a, it's on a very limited release. It's an indie film, so it's probably going to percolate out through the theaters. It's on release today, but it's like four theaters in the U.S. showing it. Uh, so that's when I saw the limited release, and it wasn't a Tampa Bay area. I just rented it on Amazon. It was worth the nine bucks to, uh, to get a 48-hour rental and watch it. Yeah, generally speaking, if you're if you have a cable system that has video on demand, uh, you can rent it that way. That's that's how I saw it. But uh, it's also available on iTunes. Uh, so it, it, today is just the first day supposedly that it's in the theaters. They're, they had a premiere at the American Museum of Natural History, but it's been out for several weeks uh, by these other methods of watching, and and so. You know, the, this is the wave of the future, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, if anyone played on your computer, really. if yeah. anyone has watched it and is watching this right now, uh, let us know in the comments what you thought of it, because we'd love to hear your your ideas as well. I I thought it was neat, and nobody would notice this probably but me. Well, they must have because they put it in the movie. Is the fact that they showed that Europa has a synchronous rotation that it keeps one hemisphere 
toward Jupiter all the time, like our moon does, because they showed Jupiter on the horizon when they landed, and I was kind of like, if they show it moving, it will change phases, but if you're on a certain location, it will always stay there at that certain location in the sky. And through their entire mission, Jupiter never moved off that horizon position. So right. like, that's kind of a, a neat little thing, but I thought it was kind of cool they added that in there. So it's tidally locked like like the the moon is to the Earth. Yeah. Like our moon. I believe yeah. all four uh, Galilean moons are tidally locked like that. They always point toward Jupiter. So if you landed, I think you'd want to land on the far side of Europa just to have that extra protection from the radiation at the bulk of the moon. So they they landed on the Ju- Jupiter facing side probably just because it was prettier, you know, because we had <laughs> Jupiter in the sky. So. Oh, but then how can you get that? Yeah, that beautiful view of Jupiter dominating yeah. the yeah. dominating the sky. Uh, have you seen it yet, Brian? I have. You yeah. have. What did you think? I I find this one and and the trailer for Gravity interesting because they're kind of a new kind of science fiction movie. They're they're science fiction that's almost not science fiction. You know, we're so used to the common science fiction where it's faster than light spaceships and aliens and everything else, and this kind of harkens back to the 2001 and you know those kind of movies where they're kind of near future projections. Yeah. Well, when you watch that Gravity trailer. It's terrifying. It really is. And you really can see those moments where the person has no way to get themselves back to a solid structure. And it and it doesn't matter, right? That rail that she's trying to reach for, it's this far away, but it doesn't matter. It might as well be light years away because you just you can't you can't you have no way to move yourself towards it without I, I will definitely something off that in my intro physics class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it. It was really well done. So I hope the whole movie stands up to the promise of the trailer. I mean, it sure looked like a catastrophic situation handled in really great detail. So I'm, I'm really excited to to watch that one. I, and I it's uh, what's it, Alfonso Conzaro? What's his name? The the director. Oh, Alfonso. I don't know. Cordero. Cordero. Yeah, Conzaro. Anyway. Um, I, I thought it was second. I thought it was kind of cool that the launch that they the footage they used for the launch in Europa report was actually a real mission to Jupiter it was the launch of Juno. It was yeah. a, I, I noticed that I thought it was MSL at first when I looked at it uh, because I knew it was a it was a it was a launch from the Cape but when I watched through the credits it was actually the NASA Juno mission that's going to be in Jupiter in 2015 I think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, great. Well, I think uh, we've got one more story here that we're just going to quickly cover, and this is that there was a recent supernova in M74. Yeah. Ryan, where is M74? Uh, I don't know what constellation. Up. It's about 30... Go ahead. Up. <laughs> it's up. It's up. <laughs> it's up about 30 million light years. Allow me to answer my own question. <laughs> it's about 30 million light years away. The constellation of Pisces. I can work Pretty 3D easy. as fast okay. as you. Okay, really? Race, yeah. <laughs> okay, M74, located in the constellation Pisces, has had a supernova. 2013 yes. EJ. Yes, and uh, it's actually the third one in about a decade. Mm-hmm. So for some reason, it's very active. Um, but it's it's a type 2 supernova. We've been able to identify the hydrogen lines. What does a type and, 2 mean? Okay, supernovas are broadly categor- they're broadly split into two types. So type 1, you don't see any observable hydrogen lines. In other words, the, the light coming off of the supernova isn't giving off hydrogen lines. Uh, type 2 gives off hydrogen. Um, what we now know is that type 1A is actually a different type from all the others. So type 1A is, is a white dwarf that's feeding off of a binary partner. Mm-hmm. Type 2 and the other type 1s are core collapse supernova. So they're big stars that run out of fuel, and collapse it on themselves, and this causes this overheating that rips them apart. Um, so this is a type 2 supernova. In fact, and the astronomy textbooks are moving away from the type 1, type 2 descriptor. Yes. They call them white dwarf supernova and core collapse supernova. So if you're learning astronomy right. now, right. you probably wouldn't even hear those terms. That's right. Right. So this is a core collapse supernova. And uh, the interesting thing is that after they identify the location, so they confirmed that it was a supernova, identify the location, and then went back to the uh, Spitzer infrared telescope data and was actually able to find it. So, so they found the progenitor as a red supergiant, and it's this, you know, this very tiny speck on the Spitzer data. But we have it from about 2004. So, so 
that's pretty rare, isn't it, to find that progenitor? Has that been done very often before? Yeah, they try. It depends on when they have the sky surveys. So this is why sky surveys are useful. Yeah, yeah, and these are these automated surveys of telescopes which right. scan the sky and they build this beautiful map, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So, Panstars, yeah. Panstars, and it, it plans to do even higher resolution ones. And I, but, but I, was it the Type One A's? There's one kind that they still haven't found the progenitors, right? So they, right. they haven't seen. They usually blow, them, blow themselves apart. Mm -hmm. And and they're small. They're white dwarfs. So so core collapse you can find because they're fairly big stars. So if they're if they're in a red supergiant stage or something, then they would be easier to see at, at you know millions of light years away. Um, right. And I think it's uh, what's interesting with uh, supernova is that many of them are discovered by amateurs. This is one of these right. parts of of astronomy that that amateurs are able to really contribute a lot to the science and find these supernovae quickly and and then trigger the the astronomers to come back with a follow up look. And I think this you know the faster we can turn this around and go from the moment that supernova happens to an amateur discovering it and then an astronomer turning a big telescope on it to get that initial data is, is great. So mm -hmm. if you're looking to, if you're an astronomer and you know the night sky and you want to participate, uh, there's real value there. Yeah. You need a daytime supernova near, not too close, <laughs> like Betelgeuse or something yeah. like that. Right. You need, you yeah. Know, we haven't had one since the invention of the telescope, so yep. that's uh, nearby a galactic supernova. We're, we're due. <laughs> Over here. Yeah, a Ada oh. Carina, Betelgeuse. But it, it could happen. Ago. It could happen across the galactic disk from us, and we'd never see it. It may have already happened yeah. sometime sure. since the telescope was invented, uh, and just because there's so much dust that we didn't, we can't see it. I believe Spica and Betelgeuse are the two closest mm -hmm. candidate supernovas, eventual supernovas. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I'd want to be around <laughs> for that. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, they're, they're, the they're far enough away. They're, they're far out of the kill zone. Okay, yeah. all right. They're out of the kill zone. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's nothing the as bright as a moon. <laughs> yeah, there's, it would just be none, super bright during the day. There's nothing there's that's none gonna kill in us. The, I think in Phil Plate's book is 200 light years. Is it what? Yeah. They classify as uh, the kill radius would be a bad day. We don't want too close. Yeah, yeah there are no supernova progenitors within that within that radius where yeah. the uh, We're radiation in a actually do harm to Earth. Right. We're fine. <laughs> We're fine, but safe. Uh, okay, great. Well, thank you uh, so much, everybody, for watching, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Now, before we go, I want to give everyone a chance to let people know where they can find out more. So, Alan Boyle, uh, when you're not in secret facilities uh, getting secret information and seeing uh, wonderful decor, uh, where do we find you? Well, cosmiclog.com would work, or science.nbcnews.com, and uh, on Twitter I'm B0YLE, which is too clever, so, but that, that's where to find me. It was B-O-Y-L-E? It was taken, L? it was oh. taken. I might have to talk to that person, whoever he is, and, and uh, see if I can work out a deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian, where do we find out more? Uh, you can find me on Google+. Plus. So I post every day. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter under my name, but basically anywhere. Look for my name. It's not very common. Yeah, and again, I, I want to recommend that you specifically, well, circle everyone, of course, but definitely circle Brian and, and check out his series of postings because it, it feels like you are running a website and your website is Google+, and, it, and you're you know, you're writing these articles there, and they're fantastic with great pictures Basically, and yeah. great descriptions, and it's just great. And it, once again, that Kickstarter, if people want to contribute to your to your show and help you get this this uh, first web series off the ground, it's what's prove it called? Prove your world, prove your world, and you can find it at proveyourworld.org or on Kickstarter. That's great. All right. Uh, yeah, so, so kick in a couple of bucks, share the information with your friends. That would be great. David Dickinson. I am Master Guys with the Z on Twitter. Uh, this week I've been active over on Universe Today. I just had a large post this morning come out on uh, the astronomical connection of the dog days of summer. If uh, anyone wants to read that, it's very interesting, and there's an observational tie into that. I'm intrigued. What a mystery. <laughs> someone should really go and check out. Everyone should go and check out that article on Universe Today. That sounds great. Yeah. And I also have an article coming out on the Parasites tomorrow on Universe Today. And I'm active over at listasore.com, canada.com, and supposedly the Weather Channel might be running some of my footage on an article on a on a show this weekend. Maybe or, they haven't told me if they're going to run it. 
Uh, they <laughs> they asked me for some footage of uh, I had a video of crepuscular rays, of a good example of crepus crepuscular rays. I can't talk today. Uh, that they're doing a show on. I believe it's as atmospheric phenomena. That I might get a two second showing on there. I don't know if they're gonna show it or not. It'd so, just be you pointing at a picture crepuscular rays and then just moving that's, on. That's that's me like just running grabbing my camera one morning before coffee and I had this awesome display of crepuscular rays over the house and I did a quick video pan of it put it on YouTube because I'd never seen them that sharp and bright. I mean it, it looked like the mothership was coming over the horizon is what it looked like. So <laughs> like that's that's great. Um, yeah, well, you know, the the pear seeds are sort of like our Christmas on uh, yeah. on Universe Today, and so we will be running a whole bunch of articles about this. I actually recorded a video just uh, just yesterday yes. about it, so about I, how to enjoy the meteor shower. We'll be I, mushing this all together, and I I have an observer's guide going out tomorrow on Universe Today. We, weekend tends to get a little more exposure. It doesn't get like piled down under 20 posts right at the beginning. So. And as we've been mentioning, this is a very special Perseids because the moon is absent and you will have a nice dark view. So if you haven't already, I know I've been nagging this every week, gather your friends and family, find a place with dark skies and find a nice open field and just enjoy the show. And if you oh, and, if and, and you are you are right too. It's pronounced per Perseids. Perseids. I, Perseids. I yeah. say I looked it up online. It's like I, I say Perseids, but you know. Finally, uh, actually, my wacky wonder Canadian, what you were saying. Finally, my wacky it's Canadian actually, accent comes to uh, my aid. Yeah, it's, it's actually pronounced Perseids is what I saw online. So. Mm -hmm. And Nicole Gallucci, it's so great to have you back. Where do Hi. we find out more? So I live at NoisyAstronomer.com. NoisyAstronomer is my Twitter handle. And I work for CosmoQuest. And I am finally back from almost a whole month of travel. I had a little break in there, and I was sick. Um, but yeah, I'm back for another whole month before we go to DragonCon. So you travel so Pamela doesn't have to. Except that she's in Europe right now. <laughs> <laughs> she just traveled more. That didn't work. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be at DragonCon this year, but I will be at the Penny Arcade Expo for okay. uh, Labor Day weekend. So if anyone's watching this and wants to hang out at Penny Arcade Expo, I am in. I'll be bringing the kids, and uh, we're going to have a good time So in Seattle, and that's Labor Day weekend. Okay, we'll be on the other coast in Atlanta, so come say hi. <laughs> well, if you haven't already, subscribe. Wherever the subscribe button is, uh, please do. Uh, wherever you're watching this, just subscribe, and that way you'll get uh, notifications. Although apparently the notifications are broken, so actually you won't get notifications when these new shows show up. But uh, still subscribe anyway, because we've got lots of other good stuff that's happening. Uh, all right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. I think the next thing Friday is going to be Sunday. We're going to do the week the the uh, virtual star party Sunday night, and uh, we've got I hope a special guest that night, which is uh, well, we'll we'll talk about it in the in the post for the virtual star party. So, uh, okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, good job, Brian. Welcome Thank aboard, you. and uh, and we'll see you all uh, next week. Thanks. Bye.